Hello and welcome to the North Coast Journal Preview, where we take a look at the stories being followed in the upcoming edition of the North Coast Journal. I'm your host, Dave Frank, and I'm joined this week by North Coast Journal's Arts and Features Editor, Jennifer Famico Cahill, and North Coast Journal staff writer, Iridian Casares. Welcome, guys. Hello. How you doing? <laughs> Pretty good. Um, we got all kinds of wind and rain and, and snow here, yeah. but uh, you know this winter storm thing isn't going to get us down. We're gonna we're gonna jump right into our coverage of what you guys got going on. Um, so Iridian, why don't you tell us about the uh, story that you've been working on about the yes. recycling CRV program? Yeah. So this story is basically kind of a look at at how the state of Humboldt's recycling came to be, you know, why Humboldt County's CRV redemption services have ceased to to exist. It's become now a burden and more of a tax than it has a CRV deposit, you know. So we go and we buy our, our drinks and we pay five to ten cents and we, we can usually go and, and, and get it back at a redemption center. But now Humboldt County doesn't have it anymore and it has to do with just the business and how it works. Um, in September, when Humboldt County, or not Humboldt County, Humboldt Waste Management Authority reopened its um, CRV services at the Eureka Recycling Center, it was just met with so much demand that there was just so many people who wanted to get their um, deposits back. And it just was, it, it wasn't capable of doing it. And it was causing lots of hazards on Broadway. And so my story is just looking at why they've closed. Basically, it has to do with the bottle bill formula and the subsidies that get that go to these recycling centers to handle and process CRV material. And so the formula is a, is a statewide average. So everyone gets the same amount of subsidies. But the problem is, is that, you know, doing business in Humboldt County is extremely different than doing business in Southern California or the Bay Area. Um, and so they don't really help a lot. Um, and so what Humboldt Waste Management Authority was doing was uh, using other um, other funds from different operations to help pay for CRV um, services. Um, and it just wasn't penciling out, so to speak. Let me, let me frame it a little bit for you. Mm -hmm. um, there's this, So you said, you described there's been a breakdown in the CRV system here in part yeah. because of COVID, um, but also in part, uh, you mentioned in your story that it's because international markets have changed because of China um, basically not mm -hmm. purchasing things like they used to. So prices have dropped. Yeah. Now we have this state law that's supposed to frame everything and kind of be this distribution of these funds in an equitable mm -hmm. manner. But you just said because of regional cost variation, that really doesn't add up. Um, and yeah. places like our local uh, facility has operated at, has operated at a loss and offset mm -hmm. that with other fees. So tell us a little bit about like, you know, given that that's where we are, there's a lot of different stakeholders in this process, like haulers and things like that. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the stakeholders and maybe their mm -hmm. position about what we could or ought to do here now? So the thing is that, you know, in order to change the formula, which is what everyone kind of wants to meet regional needs, is that um, it's probably going to have some opposition because the bottle bill has so many stakeholders. So, um, you know, it includes curbside waste haulers. Um, so like Recology, they can, for any CRV um, containers they collect, they can get uh, redemption funding from that. Um, and it also just, I don't know, it's working a lot for SoCal. And so just any change with opposition is, is going to have, you know, its impacts, right? So Cal Recycle has, uh, has really the authority mm -hmm. of jurisdiction, and I think mm -hmm. there's... Yeah, you want to tell us a little bit about no, that? No, so so that's the thing that that I've learned in writing this story is that Cal Recycle is kind of like the referee. So they, you know, call the play or not call the plays, call the fouls and make sure that everyone is following the rules, right? They don't have the authority to really like change the formula, you know. So they have to follow the rules as laid out by the law, right? And so the only the only um, entity that can change the law is 
is the legislator, right? It's okay. our lawmakers. Um, you know, it's it's going to take a lot for it to actually change. They um, they established an advisory committee, I think, that, you know, the mm-hmm. governor said he's interested in dealing with this and Cal Recycle's interested in dealing with this. And like I said, there's this committee. Um, yeah. But like, so besides the fact that you know, there's a lot of folks who claim to be working on it, it's probably going to take a while. Can you tell us a little bit about the mm-hmm. impact on like, say, community yeah. groceries here and things like that? Mm-hmm. So that's another thing about the bottle build is that grocery stores and, and you know, retailers are included in it. They have to pick up the slack, is what I say in the story. And so usually when there's a grocery store that sells about $2 million in groceries, they have to offer in-store redemption services, right? And so that would be like you going to the store, inside the store where you bought the, the can or bottle, and you return it, and you get your money right then and there. But um, what happens is that if there's a CRV redemption center in a convenience zone, so like in a radius of the store that offers that services, those stores are exempted from doing from from doing any CRV services. Um, so when um, Humboldt County's, you know, when we had CRV redemption services, stores weren't were exempted from offering it. Right? They didn't have to do it. But now that we don't have any. They all have to shift into into offering re- redemption service, right? They have to figure it out. Uh, but the problem is that unlike CRV redemption services, grocery stores don't get subsidies, so they don't they don't get paid to handle and process this material um, unless they are a certified recycling center. But they also don't get the money to start it, right? Um, and so they can opt out from offering the services according to the law and by paying a hundred dollar a day fee, oh, right? Wow. Um, it's a hundred dollars a day or three thousand. Is it three thousand a month? Um, and it adds up to thirty six thousand dollars a year, right? And so, you know, I spoke to Greg Fillmore at Eureka Natural Foods, and he just kind of said that that it was unfair, you know, that they have to offer these services while Humboldt County recycling or CRV services aren't up, you know, and he said that they don't have the infrastructure or the ability to do so, right, to, to take in all of these, these, um, these bottles and cans, you know, they're really wanting cow recycle and, and everyone to come to the table to figure it out. And I think, you know, the same thing kind of can be said for, for the Eureka Recycling Center CRV services is that they weren't able to handle everyone from Humboldt County trying to get their deposits back. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really up to the legislator to to help us out here. Yeah, I was going to say there's these players that like grocery stores and convenience stores that are experiencing um, this burden you described. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's some exemptions in place uh, that's Mm -hmm. based on alternative sites and um, economic viability was one of those other, you know, I guess Mm -hmm. uh, caveats that maybe they could opt out. But so Mm -hmm. given the situation now, like me and you both, we have friends that people that we know that are like, hey, when can I get my money for this stuff that's sitting around? Mm -hmm. Um, How are people responding? How are how are our community members currently yeah. responding to this impasse? Well, a lot of us, well, for me personally, I've been putting my CRV materials into curbside. So the thing is that, you know, right now, recycling is still an option. You know, it's not that because CRV services are gone now, we can't recycle. You can still recycle, but you just have really, really limited options. You can either go to Crescent City and get your, um, deposits back there or Reading, right? You have to make this three hour, two hour, one way trip um, to get it back, right? Or you can just put it in your curbside bin. And what's been happening um, with with Recology here is that they're seeing an increase in CRV materials. Um, so it was like 16% before the pandemic and before the closure of all our uh, CRV services, it was like at 16%, but now it's risen to 20% in a typical load. So yeah, so you can either put it in your curbside bin or travel or just hoard it until yeah. <laughs> we have uh, our services back, right? But I, I don't know, I feel like it's it's been piling up, right? Um, just yeah. hoard it next to your pile of really good cardboard boxes. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I was going to say this is really, this is really. There's so much there in the article, is, and yeah. I really recommend that folks check it out. I hope to uh, pick up the conversation with you about it. Just to put it in mm -hmm. perspective for folks, um, you have this really cool graphic in the article that shows that like it's over a billion dollars of CRV we're talking about, and it's approaching mm -hmm. a billion and a half. There's this mismatch in the amount that's working its way back into consumers' hands, mm -hmm. and yeah. so the bigger players are getting more of the money. More of the money is going unallocated because. Yes. The, basically means people aren't recycling like they ought to, or there's this huge backlog, a hundred million dollars worth sitting in people's garages. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll follow this again. Uh, we'll pick this up yes. again in the future. Thank you so Definitely. much. Yeah. Yeah. I really hope this gets resolved because that's my nest egg sitting in the garage right now <laughs> is all the bottles and cans. And yeah. as much as I would mm -hmm. like to leave that for my children <laughs> upon my death to sort through, um, it might be nice to maybe be able to spend some of it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Nickels and dimes, but it adds up. It definitely adds up. All right. Well, thank you again, Aridian. Um, mm -hmm. Jennifer, why don't you tell us a little bit about the article that Sad wrote? Uh, I think yesterday about. Yeah, uh, I encourage. Back. Yeah, I encourage everybody to go online and check and like hit refresh because mm -hmm. we're going to be updating this story, I'm sure, very soon. But basically, uh, you know, while our um, new public health officer uh, was talking to the um, Humboldt County Board of Supervisors about, you know, rolling out uh, vaccines and whatnot. And um, the state, meanwhile, unbeknownst to them, uh, was revamping their whole rollout plan and putting together, you know, they're putting together a whole new set of guidelines and everything. And meanwhile, you can still use the county's website to kind of get yourself in the queue and whatnot, but it is, you know, it does kind of feel like, okay, we did all this work to figure it out locally, and then they're going to roll out a statewide plan. Er, but yeah. um, <laughs> the main thing is just availability of vaccine. So we can have the best rollout plan in the world, and we can establish the most fair and equitable and wonderful set of prioritization for people over this age or people with disabilities or, you know, people with different jobs, but it doesn't matter until we get the vaccine. Yeah. So we just don't have enough in the county. And so we're going to, and, and we don't know exactly when more is coming, I think, um, mm -hmm. or we don't know a, a firm schedule. So it's very hard to plan. And so as much as, um, you know, different supervisors were spending time saying that we need to prioritize teachers and things like that, it, doesn't matter until we have vaccines in our hands. So once we have, you know, shots, 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 then we can start doling them out. Yes. It's a new definition of that song, I think. Yes. The application. <laughs> Is that not what it meant before? I think it's <laughs> I think it's very square over here. Yeah. yeah. It had something to do with alcohol, I suspect. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I was just going to add to what you said that last night, uh, Senator McGuire did a town hall where there was very little new information and a whole slew of questions. I mean, it was very helpful, very insightful, but just a couple of new pieces of information, like the state portal is going to be called my turn, but that it's mm -hmm. not available yet and that people will use that, but not yet. So for now, stick with the local public health officers, uh, you know, public health organizations mm -hmm. website, get in queue. And definitely keep checking back to the website because as soon as we have information about, you know, when more vaccines are coming and what the, you know, what the rollout is, is going to look at, look like in terms of, um, of application, in terms of practicality, um, we'll be on top of that. So keep checking back on the journal website. Fantastic. Um, how about we uh, transition to something a little lighter? Uh, what are you covering I mean, this? Is it lighter? <laughs> is it lighter though? Because okay, so we're talking about crab. Okay, let's do that. Specifically, anytime we're talking about crab, I would like everyone to remember that a boat capsized. Was it this weekend? What day is it? Um, and three crab fishermen had to be um, rescued by the Coast Guard um, because of smashing into the jetty and whatnot. So. Um, Nobody complain about the price of crab. That's super really important. Let's start with that. Don't complain about the price of crab. Um, this is the kind of risk people take, the kind of work people do to bring you crab. So once it's here, be grateful, be thank you, thankful, and you know, enjoy it. Enjoy it fully. Mm -hmm. Are you a Chipino person? I so love it. 
Okay. See, this is the, it's a very Italian moment, the Cipino moment. So Rod Cousin, who you may know from our trophy case column, he writes a lot about, you know, um, sports history in Humboldt County. It turns out we had a lot of Olympians. Who knew? Um, if Cousin does not strike you as a particularly Italian name, you're not crazy. It's not. His mother, who actually was Swiss, um, probably learned this recipe from the community in which she lived, which was in Ferndale with a lot of Italians um, and a lot of, I imagine, fishermen. Um, Humboldt County has a long and storied history of Italian fishermen. And similar to in um, you know, the Bay Area, you had a lot of Italian fishermen coming together and um, sometimes helping each other out at the end of the day when there wasn't as much catch in your nets as you'd hoped for. Um, supposedly a particular um, restaurant started this um, in the Bay Area in San Francisco, but before that it was sort of a tradition that you would add something to the chopin, which the chopin is a Italian kind of a bastardization from the uh, Genoese for little soup, just oh, a little soup, right. which is kind of ironic to me because Rod's recipe in this week's table on the table column is a very big soup. He's not playing games. He's <laughs> feeding an army and you are going to need, I don't know, can you light a fire under a bathtub? You need a very big <laughs> pot. It's going to have to be like the Bugs Bunny pot that they were always right. trying to cook him in because it's for like seven or eight crabs. According to Rod, this should sh probably feed about nine to ten people because you've also got like the soup and the bread. And the bread is very important. You need a ton of sourdough bread, which he used to get or his family used to get from his uncle who worked at Parisian in uh, San Francisco, which was a very old, um, it's like more than a hundred year old uh, bread company in San Francisco that I think ran, went under recently. But um, for Rod's family, you know, it was a kind of a big deal because his parents used to own the Ivanhoe in Ferndale. So when they were owners of the Ivanhoe, his dad ran the bar and his mom made batches, vats of Chipino. And so he has his mom's Chipino recipe, including a couple of ways in which he has strayed from the recipe Please don't let lightning hit me. Um, <laughs> but he has this great recipe for this massive pot of Chipino that cooks all day. Is there some crab murder? There is. <laughs> if, you are, if you are not comfortable throwing a live crab into a pot, which he says that's real Chipino. you got to throw them in live, which I'm like, I'm going to get letters. The letters I'm going to get. Um a while back, I think for a Wendy Chan recipe for like a, what was it, like a black bean or French butter crab, I think. Um, I looked up, I watched like a hundred crab snuff films on YouTube to learn how to kill a crab humanely. And one of them is you grab it by the back legs and then kind of one, two, three, swing it into the corner of like a kitchen table or counter. And you hit it kind of right in that V on its belly and that'll like kill it instantly. And you throw it in the pot and it's fine. But um, Rod and his murderous family prefer to throw them in live. Um, and they cook in tomato sauce. Um, when he gave me the original garden, uh, pardon me, the original uh, recipe, he gave me like the random amounts that like your grandma gives you. Some rosemary, a lot of garlic half a bottle of cheap wine, you know, like it's all very, you know, home yeah. recipe stuff. So um, I had a fight with him over the phone <laughs> until I finally got it down to like 12 cloves of garlic and five sprigs of rosemary, but it's a great recipe. And it's going to be that very old timey Humboldt Chipino that, you know, your parents and your grandparents enjoyed in the forties uh, when his family owned it. So I strongly recommend that everybody, Give it a shot. We need to celebrate, enjoy, and, you know, pay without complaint for a crab while we have it. So I meant to ask you, um, I have had this a few times in my day. It's part of the reason I'm as large as I am, uh, because you're basically like bread and soup, you know, like you're, yeah. you don't have a spoon, you have a bread, right? And, dredging uh, and dredging. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so there was, in this recipe, there was a, an ingredient that no one ever told me about, which is the secret ingredient, I think, is sherry, right? 
Yeah, he puts sherry Sweet in it. it up a little bit? Yeah, instead of, he doesn't use sugar, he uses sherry, which, you know, the addition of sugar into tomato sauce is the source of much contention. But um, his, you know, his variation, I think, is something that you could play with. But I would try it his way. Try it the sherry with the sherry and then see what happens. Well, I'm definitely going to try that one. Um, can you tell us, uh, we have a little bit of time left. Tell us what else you, is in the Arts and Features beat this week that you worked on. Um, yeah, I do have a satirical column. Um, I have a seriously column this week about adjusting post-inauguration. I have been talking to, well, I, first of all, I've been reading lots and lots of articles about, you know, what hardline QAnon folks are thinking and dealing with in chat rooms and, you know, how people are adjusting to the disappointment of the election. But I also feel that there is some shock and confusion around people who were spent the last five years desperate to get rid of Trump. For a lot of us, it's sort of like when you get off a plane in the wrong time zone or you come out of a movie theater in the middle of the day and you're like, what is happening? It's disorienting. I'm not, you know, freaking out on Twitter every five. Well, that's not true. I'm a journalist. I'm still freaking out on Twitter every five minutes. But um, I have some sort of tongue in cheek tips for people who are adjusting to weird new circumstances like sleeping through the night. <laughs> Unusual things like that. Unusual things like that. And you can, you know, you can find ways to get back to maybe 40 percent of your previous anxiety levels and just kind of wean yourself back into normal life um, while still hopefully saving a little energy for um, working on things that we still need to improve in this country. Like, I don't know, maybe all of the, you know, white supremacists and um, pandemic. There's still lots and lots of work. Uh, for us all to do. So I want everybody to acclimate, but maybe not get too relaxed. Yeah. And like you said, you know, keep, keep true to your convictions and you'll find a way to channel that energy. So there's a lot of work, like you said. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Aridion, again, thank you for joining us this week. That was a really um, informative article. And like I said, I, I, I'm sure we'll follow yeah. it as it evolves. Um, everybody out there, uh, that's just about going to do it for us this week. North Coast Journal is available on newsstands and online. Pick one up, stay informed, stay safe. Uh, Ridian, Jennifer, thank you again so much, and we'll see you again soon. Wear a mask.